1971, after having worked in Chicago for a year, my husband and I moved to live in Aberdeen. Um, living in Aberdeen was just such a huge relief after living in Chicago, which was a very violent city. And this was reflected in what I saw in Chicago. So much of my physiotherapy rehabilitation was to do with stab wounds and gunshot wounds and head injuries and injuries that come from living in a violent city. Uh, Aberdeen, in sharp contrast, was a delightful Scottish town close to the uh, place where our ancestors came at the foot of the highlands and very Scottish. Um, as New Zealanders we were very readily accepted and we slipped into society uh, very easily and felt very comfortable within society there as compared to Chicago where we felt like strangers. I worked at the Aberdeen Royal Infirmary uh, which was a very interesting place to work. There was a school of physiotherapy there run by Rosemary Lane. Uh, Rosemary was an English physiotherapist who had been principal for many years at the um, Aberdeen School of Physiotherapy. It was a very run in a very old-fashioned way. Um, we s strictly had to wear uniform and brown lace-up shoes and our hair had to be off our collar. The students were ruled like a rod of iron and uh, this, although we weren't ruled like a, a rod of iron, it was still fairly strict and conservative. We wore white starched uniforms with these dreadful buttons again that caught on your stockings and we used to wear a um, physiotherapy blue elastic belt that uh, clipped around your waist uh, to distinguish us as physiotherapists. But revolutions even happen up in Scotland and uh, while we were there they changed the uniform from this dreadful white starched uniform to trousers and a top and we were one of the first places in Britain to have uh, trousers. There were navy trousers and a white top uh, which was much much better to wear. Um, I worked in thoracic surgery and the professorial surgical unit and I also had the private ward. Uh, when I was working in the evening clinic at, it was called Woman Hill, uh, at, as part of the Aberdeen Royal Infirmary Physiotherapy Department, I used to do this evening clinic. It wasn't an area I particularly enjoyed. Um, I have some very strong me memories of the type of people who would come in the evenings, often tended to be very much working class people. One man in particular I remember, he had uh, some sort of back problem and I asked him to remove his clothes so that I could see his back. And it was obviously winter time, well it was winter time most of the time in Aberdeen, and um, the heaters were on and he uh, stripped down and took off his woolen singlet and placed it on the heater. And I do recall the smell as uh, this woolen singlet that he hadn't uh, probably hadn't been washed for well over a week, the smell of it as the heat warmed it up. I know it would have been very nice for him to put on, but the smell wasn't great uh, as I smelt it in the clinic. The de domestic revolution had bypassed Aberdeen and at least a third of the ha houses in Aberdeen didn't have a bathroom and people went to the bathhouse on a weekly basis. I also recall doing faradism for our feet there. We, we did foot baths and we had to have two uh, electrodes. Uh, I was doing it, I presume, for some flat feet. I have no idea. But it was, I remember doing it and f disliking doing it and the patient didn't particularly like it. And it wasn't a treatment that I liked having been done on myself. After six months in uh, outpatients, I applied for and got the job as a senior in thoracic surgery and looking after the professorial unit and the private ward and that was very much more my cup of tea. Uh, in the thoracic surgery, uh, surgery unit we had two surgeons, um, an older man called Mr Gow and a slightly younger person called Mr Brunner. Uh, Mr Gow was an old fashioned uh, surgeon who didn't believe in giving information to patients and very often patients did not know that they were going to surgery for cancer of the lung which made it very difficult for one as a physiotherapist uh, 
uh, working with such a person because patients often know, wanted to know. Uh, they knew they just had a condition which needed the lung being removed, either pneumonectomy or a uh, lobectomy. But um, often, of course, they didn't want to know why uh, as part of the denial. But um, giving information and uh, with the patient, often the, the relative was told, but the, the, the wife was told, but not the patient. Um, the routine for a uh, post uh, or for a thoracotomy at that time was I would see every patient preoperatively when I'd go over the breathing exercises that uh, I would be doing with them, making sure they could do that. Um, I would go over the, oh, of course, clearing their chest because uh, the majority of them were smokers and most of them hadn't stopped smoking. Uh, of course, many of them were chronic bronchitics. Um, they had some degree of. Uh, obstructive, uh, chronic obstructive respiratory disease. Uh, also going over uh, the arm exercises and explaining uh, the uh, routine post-operatively. Then post-op they were always nursed in a single room. The thoracic ward was in a modern, very modern part of the hospital. It was, had been just rebuilt and um, so there were uh, private rooms for each of these post-op thoracic patients. Uh, and uh, they were, they'd come back from surgery with two intercostal tubes, one for the, uh, to remove air and one to remove uh, or drain fluids. And they would be kept in bed until these uh, tubes were uh, removed, which was usually about day two or day three. And then the, uh, so we'd do breathing exercises with them at that time, clearing their chest, of course. Many of them had very grotty chests, so often needed intensive post-op physiotherapy. And once they were, uh, the tubes, intercostal tubes were removed, we'd get them up and mobilise them up and down the ward. And then on day five, they would come to a post-op thoracic uh, surgery uh, class where we would do uh, breathing exercises and uh, also mobilise their arm. It was not uncommon to have uh, uh, stiff arms post-op if we didn't work on them. Uh, trying to find the, the men, because actually most of them were men, uh, was always a challenge because they would disappear <clears throat> just before the class. But the commonest place to find them was uh, in the, the toilet where they would be smoking. <clears throat> the men's toilet was yellow with um, smoke and you could always smell the smoke in the men's toilet. In those days, of course, we had no appreciation of the fact that um, smoking was so addictive. Uh, some of these men had such severe chronic lung disease and had a, had, had a pneumonectomy and uh, could barely, barely had enough breath to breathe, let alone draw a, a cigarette, but uh, they were so addicted to, their, addicted to, to their cigarette. And usually they would go home somewhere between seven and 10 days post-op, uh, and that would be the end of their physiotherapy treatment. Uh, the, younger surgeon Mr Brunner was very good to work with because his I think one of the things was his daughter was a physiotherapist and on the staff and he was very open to uh, to physiotherapy and uh, what we could do. Mm -hmm.